it's quite amazing really to think that this bird has flown just over 4,000 miles. It's the size of a robin, weighs about 21 grams. That bird has flown all the way from Sierra Leone back to Grafton Water. This episode is an edited version of a live-streamed conversation I had with Mike Drew, Biodiversity Advisor for Anglian Water and Nightingale Population Monitor. Welcome to the Casual Birder Podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take time to watch birds as I go about my daily tasks. In my show, I'll tell you about the wild birds I've seen, speak with experts and enthusiasts, go on bird outings, and share stories from birders around the world. In case you missed it, last episode was my celebration of producing 100 episodes. I was joined by two birder friends, singer-songwriter Stephanie Seymour and storyteller Mary Lee Stevenson, to chat about our recent bird sightings, what birding means to us, and our top tips for new birders. We also heard from friends of the show and past guests who sent their messages of congratulations and shared a few birding stories. Do take a listen. This episode is brought to you by Casual Birder Weekly, the show's newsletter. Each edition brings updates and videos about the birds I've seen, tips to help you get the best birding experiences, and I'll let you know about any planned group birdwatch events, all delivered straight to your inbox. The newsletter has been on hiatus and will be starting up again on the release of this episode, so sign up now. The link is in the episode notes. Mike Drew is a biodiversity advisor and licensed bird ringer. For the last 10 years, he's monitored nightingale nesting sites in Cambridgeshire. The data he's gathered has helped inform habitat action plans produced by the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology. I first heard Mike speak about his work with nightingales earlier this year. Until then, I really knew very little about them, having never heard or seen one. Nightingales are small songbirds that live most of the time in Africa, migrating to England and Europe for a few weeks in the summer to breed. Slightly larger than a European robin, about the size of a large peach, they have mostly brown upper parts, pale underparts and a reddish tail. However, they're not often seen as they mostly feed in low vegetation and sing from cover. They're known for their fluty complex song, which has inspired poets, writers and composers. Mike tells us about the incredible journey that nightingales make each year, his involvement in the monitoring project and how he was drawn to birds from a young age. This episode is an edited version of the live-streamed conversation I had with Mike, in which he shared slides to illustrate his points. I've minimised references to visual slides as much as possible, but if you'd like to watch the full recording, please go to the Casual Birder Podcast YouTube channel. You'll find the link in the episode notes. Mike, you're a biodiversity advisor for Anglian Water, is that right? That's correct, yeah. I've been the advisor for uh, just over 14 years now. And for 10 of those years, you've been involved in nightingale research alongside your day job. Yep. It's very interesting to be kind of getting up at three o'clock in the morning to be going out into kind of those dark early mornings and to go and survey for nightingales and then to kind of carry on with the day job not long after that. Yes, that that would be quite trying, I would think, even though it must be a magnificent experience to actually spend so much time with nightingales. You have been interested in birds, you told me, ever since you were a young child. Can you remember your your first experiences with birds? I think from what my parents have said, that as soon as I was able to walk, that I was always kind of interested in in wildlife, Um, from the very small things from like ants to spiders right the way up to to birds and my mum used to say that because I when I was little I could never properly say bird and actually we used to refer to them as um, as a dower so I'd be sitting in a pushchair going dower dower and pointing out birds from a pushchair so it was kind of from a very early age that I would be pointing out birds and 
And then as I grew up, it kind of developed from there. So when I went through school, it was not really a cool thing to be um, labelling or identifying birds and that. So those kind of things were kept a little bit quiet whilst I went through school. But yeah, then it kind of grew really after that. And, and here I am today. And I totally hear what you're saying about it perhaps being a little bit uncool when we were at school to to talk about birds. But thankfully, it seems the tide is turning and there are a lot of young people getting involved in bird watching nowadays. So when did you start getting more involved with birds? When was it that you felt more comfortable talking about birds and, and being you know, out in nature looking for them? I think it would almost be going towards the latter part of my school years when I was going getting ready to go to an agricultural college near near Stafford back in the mid 90s when I'd probably say that I started really honing in on different species of birds and and kind of remembering that towards the the latter part of the 90s when I went over to Wales to go and see red kites and getting quite excited about seeing those and and I think when I went down to down into Cornwall uh, back in I think it was at 99 that I got to see buzzards for the first time. And I got quite excited about seeing buzzards sat on a fence post. And and then like nowadays that where I live currently now, that it's not uncommon to be seeing buzzards or red kites every single day. So it's probably kind of key milestones that, that you remember. And I remember, I think when I was about about 11, going rock climbing in the in the Peak District, and seeing what I would say was a, an unusual blackbird. And then it wasn't until later on that um, I was on a training course and they said, did we want to go over to the, the Peak District, this rocky outcrop where there was ringoozles? And I'd say, yeah, well, then let's go over there and see some ringoozles. And and I'd say, ah, that's what those birds were when I was about 10 years old. I just thought they were a strange blackbird. As soon as you said a strange blackbird, I thought, oh, my goodness, that's a ringoozle. Now, when was it that you first saw your first or heard your first nightingale? I heard my first nightingale back in 2002 when uh, I became the assistant warden at Grafham Water, which was a, a site kind of owned by, it is owned by Anglian Water, but it's managed by uh, the Beds, Cams and North Hans Wildlife Trust. So I first got to hear my first nightingale in the, the April of 2002 that kind of started work with them on habitat management back in uh, the September of, of 2001. Actually, what we should do is describe what a, a nightingale is for people um, who may never have seen one and may not really know much about them. Um, all I knew about them was, well, first of all, I knew that there was a song about a nightingale singing in, is it Barclay Square? Um, yeah. And that they used to be very common, but now much, much less so. Because they are thought to be very strong singers and, and have very complex phrases in their song, I have fooled myself a few times thinking I've heard a nightingale when in fact it's been a song thrush. But would you just describe a little bit about what they look like? So basically a nightingale is a, it's about the same size of a robin, so a European robin. And if you imagine looking at a robin but without a red breast, so it is generally brown all over. There's a slight different shades of brown over it but generally it's brown and then it's kind of got a, a rufousy orangey brick red tail to it um so yeah so you are you're more likely to hear them than actually see them and they've got the ability to almost throw their kind of their song a little bit so you could be stood right next to one and not actually really see it so uh, their song is is kind of more what they're recognized for and also that that nightingales go right the way back in in kind of history with folklore and stories and there's a lot of people that have written about them like Keats and things like that. So yeah, so like you say that the about the Barclay Square, the nightingale that's sung in Barclay Square that's quite that's quite nice, but uh, but it's probably probably a robin that was actually singing back then rather than rather than a nightingale. But it's always quite a nice kind of story to talk about. So the project I did back in 2012 was kind of a collaboration between Angling Water, uh, the BTO, and where I was concentrating a lot of my work was at Grafham Water. So that's kind of managed by the Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire, Northampton Wildlife Trust. So the nightingale is 
a very charismatic bird in terms of its song, but it's associated with scrubby trees. So that's like blackthorn and hawthorn um, and brambles and bits like that. They were traditionally a, a woodland kind of bird that used to follow coppice rotations around. So basically coppicing is where you cut a tree down to the base of the, the ground and you allow the, the tree regrowth to, to come up from it. And it would be kind of almost about 15 years, 20 years before those birds would be back into those kind of areas and they'd be suitable for them. But as woodland management has kind of dropped off a little bit because of woodland production here in the UK, that's, that's one of the, the issues with the part of the decline. So the project back in 2012 was to look at why nightingales are declining in the country and is there actually anything that we can be doing to prevent that decline. So over the past 40 years, um, it doesn't sound long, but the, but the actual population of nightingales have declined by about 90%. So there's a lot of thought about why the birds are declining. Is it down to climate change, which is that's having a kind of a big impact? But you've also got the um, areas of land that's now being developed on. So whether that's for housing or roads or for agriculture. And also you've got the kind of the lack of management as well. So because they, the birds are, they nest in, in kind of scrubby habitat. So it's anything from the ground to about a metre high that if it gets too open at the bottom, then it means that they're open for predation. And also that you've got one of the other things over here in the, in the UK, uh, which is a problem with munchak deer, uh, which are a non-native invasive species. So they'll be browsing off all the, the low vegetation and exposing those nests. But also there's uh, you've got issues with rabbit grazing as well. Initially, the, the project was looking at, at three sites, and then in 2015, we bought on Alton Water, where we've got another reservoir, which is owned by England Water, and we've got about 30 pairs of singing males on that site. So we bought that project in as well. My kind of focus area is, is graph and water. So from 2012 to 2018, I've worked out that we've walked 516 miles. We've spent... 393 hours listening for nightingales. I've carried out 131 surveys and I've had 72 volunteers, whether that's from angling water with people within the business or uh, friends and family that have helped out as well. And then I've spent 408 hours um, out on the, the nature reserve ringing and catching nightingales. So when we're going out and doing the, the surveys, with, with all surveys that you want, and this is kind of for scientific data, the best thing to do is to follow the same route as what you're going to do for the, the next time after that so that the, the results are that can be compared and that they're comparable with each other so that you're always trying to keep the same thing. And the surveys were carried out uh, four times a week, so we were doing like two early mornings, so just before dawn, and then two midnight surveys as well. And within the mix of all that, I was still going out bird ringing as well. And despite the weather that we were out there, whatever the weather was throwing at us, so I think on my second visit that it was it was absolutely throwing it down. And you thought, crikey, I've got to get out of the car into all this rain. But we did find that when it was really foggy on sites that the, the birds never really sang that much because the song doesn't resonate that much in the fog. So uh, so that was kind of slightly disappointing when you were out at, at midnight and, and it was thick with fog and you weren't hearing any birds, but you'd still got kind of a three-hour walk around the, the whole of the site. What we also did was that, uh, that I mapped or marked down the, the arrival times of when we were getting nightingales out onto to site. So the birds were starting to get were starting to come into on site earlier and earlier and then by 2018 they went back up to um, the 25th of April and if people can kind of cast their minds back but in 2018 was when we had the beast from the east so I know that we had that in the March but if you imagine that a nightingale is coming all the way up from Africa that by the time it was hitting France kind of in the um, like latter part of March that they also had snow so 
that was one of the reasons why the birds kind of arrived in the UK late. And that was the same for a lot of the other migrant species as well. Mike then explained how the surveyors noted where they heard nightingales singing, which allowed them to estimate where their territories were. The local habitat was also coded to help identify those features of interest to nightingales. If interactions with other nightingales were heard, that also helped to define the individual territories. From the starting point in 2012, the apparent local population increased year on year until 2015. It started decreasing each year after that. In 2018, they only heard one bird, but that could have been due to late arrivals because of the weather conditions, as he previously mentioned. The numbers then started increasing again, and fortunately they were able to survey after lockdown ended in 2020. And then when you kind of overlay all those data marks that you start to see where your scrubby habitats are, and this will then start to hopefully form your kind of management plan that we've got on site. So we can now target the specific types of management for for nightingales. So like I said, that a nightingale likes the thick, dense, scrubby habitat. But with this bit, it's getting quite old. At the bottom, there's lots of gaps. So one of the things that I did back in 2001 was that I suggested to to my manager at the time that when we're doing the, the, the management for nightingales, that rather than doing the coppicing work where you're kind of resetting things back to for almost 15 years, that could we not try something like hedge laying? So this is kind of scrub layering. So you're basically cut in through the back of the tree and bending it over and it's the the tree still alive because you've got the front section that is still attached to the main part of the stump and that will allow the sap and that to rise up through the tree and then the new little bits of regrowth that will then be kind of filling in these extra gaps. So this was kind of a mixture of, of scrub layering and coppice work and then you were leaving some of the tall bits so that the nightingales could actually be sinking from. And we found that with this type of management, I'm not saying that it's it's the type of management to do, but we found here at Grafham that that within about four years we were having the nightingales return into these these patches. And because we we'd worked with the with the British Trust for Ornithology, we then revised the uh, managing scrub for nightingales, a little handbook that can be downloaded from their website. And we've got a case study in there with with Grafham. So that was quite quite exciting, really, to to kind of have the the work that I've been doing since 2001 actually being documented and put down into into something that's potentially usable. So when you go out catching nightingales, um, it's all done under license. So I've got a special license that allows me to play a, a recording of a of a male nightingale singing. And it allows me to entice him out of the scrub around. And it makes him think that there's another male um, singing in his territory. And because nightingales, it's only the males that sing. The female doesn't. She does like a little croaking noise. But the male is the one that has the has the song. So you play a, a recording for him. And hopefully he responds to that and, and flies into the net. And then... You carefully take the bird out of the net and then now we've got the bird in in our hands and this is when we start to to ring the bird and the bird is probably in your hands for a few minutes and while you're taking down various measurements so you kind of make sure that it is a male that's that's come into the into the net and then we take some measurements so we take a, a measurement of their wings um, and their tail feathers because the other bit with them being a migratory species that there's there's now actually thought that birds are starting to um, develop longer wing feathers to to get those bigger migration journeys so if you think of some of the black birds that we see over in the in the winter in this country that we get an influx of birds that come over from Scandinavia and when you catch the Scandinavian blackbirds They don't really look an awful lot different to our UK ones, but their wings are actually slightly longer. So, uh, so yes, by taking these extra measurements, we're starting to build a bigger picture of how birds are actually starting to evolve and um, and developing longer wing feathers. 
So part of the project was to try and work out why the species of bird is in massive decline. Mike described the trackers that they attach to the birds. There are two types, a geolocator, which measures light intensity levels, and a GPS, which gives more accurate position data and for retrieval purposes identifies a five metre radius of the tag. The geolocator is a bit less precise. So you put these on the bird and then you release them and then you then have to catch them the following year to retrieve the data. So it's not like the tags that you see with cuckoos or or ospreys or even like the the white-tailed eagles, that those transmitters are a lot bigger and they're able to to connect up to satellite and that information can be uh, downloaded straight to a, a laptop or a computer. But whereas these ones, you actually need that bird to make that journey back to the UK um, before you can take that data off it or the tag off it. And the tag looks, it acts like almost like a little rucksack. So you put it over the, over the legs and it sits over the back of the bird. Then what we then did was that we marked down the locations of where we'd release the birds with trackers so that the following year we could come back into those same locations to to catch those birds again. So in 2012, we, we had permission to put out 20 trackers on the back of the birds. And in 2013, we received, we caught 13 of those 20 birds, which is quite amazing because we only really expected about five to actually make that journey back. But to actually have 13 uh, was quite amazing, really. The trackers revealed that the birds travelled to East Africa, to Senegal, the Gambia and Guinea. When reviewing the data of the tagged birds, Mike noticed something unusual about the track of four of them. So normally when you think of birds that migrate for the winter, that as soon as they hit their wintering grounds, that that's it, they stay there all winter until the spring the following year before they move then back north, uh, back to their breeding grounds. But uh, these four decided that they would actually have a second winter elsewhere, uh, which was quite unusual. As an example, Mike tells us about one particular bird. So it arrived in Africa on the the 12th of September, and then on the 8th of February it left and then came down to Sierra Leone on the 13th of February, where it was then there until the 22nd of March, before it then left and came back up to the UK. So whilst we've been doing kind of our surveys and our studies over in the in England in the UK our counterparts have been doing their 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 research as well and you can start to see that actually our UK ones that come up through Africa and into Europe and back to back to the southeast and the central part of England that our population doesn't actually mingle or meet up with any of the other kind of European birds, you see the Bulgarian ones that they go into almost Central Africa and don't actually meet up with any of the other populations. So this is one of the other thoughts that why probably the UK population might not be doing very well because it doesn't actually meet up with any of the other populations. So it's kind of its own, you could almost say, sub-race of, of a nightingale, of the European nightingale. Following the tracking data of one bird, the autumn-winter migration can be seen, and then its return route to Grafham Water. So it left Sierra Leone on the 22nd of March, and then it hit southern Spain by the 25th. So within three days, it took three days to actually fly over the, the best part of Africa. And then where it rested up and fed for um, a couple of weeks before it then moved up into kind of northern France, and then before it came back into uh, Grafham Water. So it arrived at Grafham Water on the, the 19th, and I happened to be out on site on the 20th when I heard it in the location that we managed to get the tag off it. It's quite amazing, really, to think that this bird has flown about uh, just over 4,000 miles, if you think of a straight line, that this bird has flown. And to think that it's the size of a robin, it weighs about... 21 grams so yeah so quite amazing really to think that that bird has flown all the way from Sierra Leone to back to Grafham Water. In his talk Mike described how ringing the birds has revealed information about their movements when back on site at Grafham Water. 
A particular segment of scrub may house a singing nightingale year on year. It might be thought the same bird chooses that location each time it returns. However, ringing, which allows individual birds to be identified, has revealed that the birds may be displaced in subsequent years by new birds, perhaps those arriving earlier and claiming a particular territory, and then the original bird would have to find new territory, but on the same site. I asked Mike why the birds migrate so far north to us in the UK, when locations in France, where they stop over to rest and feed, might provide suitable nesting sites there. When they start coming up into the UK, we're kind of in their most northerly part of their territory range. So we know about kind of with climate change in that, where as the climate is starting to get warmer, we've started to see kind of species of whether it's birds or butterflies actually starting to move further north. Well, with nightingales, that it's the kind of the exact opposite. It's actually decreasing and it's being, they're being pulled kind of almost to the southeast. But, uh, but yeah, so they are, when you start getting up towards Grafham um, and Rutland Water, that they are almost at their most northerly range of them. They arrive in beginning of April and then... Yeah, by the end of July, they're then starting to make their way back out of the UK, back down to Africa. So they're they're only here for a couple of couple of months. And probably one of the other reasons why they why they make that massive journey is because of the the amount of daylight hours that we have. So if you think at the moment that it's starting to get light at four o'clock in the morning, and I mean like now it's what. 20 to 9 and it's still light out there so it was still we still probably got about another 15 more minutes of daylight hours so that's a, a a long time for those birds to be feeding up and that's that's one of the other reasons and that they're up here and because if you think down in africa that you're so close to the equator that you'll only be having like 12 hours of daylight so the sun rises really quick and then it goes really fast it's not really a proper sunset down on the equator so uh, so yeah so only having 12 hours of daylight down there compared to 18 hours something like that of daylight hours and also that in terms of their their breeding the call we talked about the call earlier that when the male sings at night so that's usually the best time to be hearing them because you don't you don't get to hear all the other birds like the like the dawn chorus as, as nice as that is, but when you're trying to survey for, for nightingales, it's easy to go kind of in the middle of the night at midnight because that is really the only bird that's singing. But at those kind of times that the, the male call, not that we really hear any difference in it, but that's more about attracting a female that's flying at night. So it's attracting her to, to him, to his territory. And then as soon as the daylight starts to appear, his call slightly changes and becomes more aggressive. And that is to kind of ward off rival males out of his patch. So generally, once he's paired up with a female, his his call changes and he goes into more of like a croaking and pipping type noise. He'll do a little bit of singing, but not very much. And that's because he's got a he's got a female and she's probably on eggs somewhere. They incubate the or she incubates the eggs for about 14 days. And then about 12 days later, once they've hatched, um, within 12 days, those those chicks are ready to be leaving the nest and they'll be feeding up before they start making their way back off to Africa. So a really quick turnaround when you think about it. Yeah, really amazing. We have had one question from Denise Foss. Do you ring females too? I do. It's very hard to to catch the females because they they don't really respond that much to to the lures it's more of the males that that respond to them but but i have had a few females and that's because when i've recorded a male singing that i've gone out in the middle of the night and recorded a, a singing male and and i think that that's one of the other reasons why i've been catching females because when i play that call it attracts the females out Whereas if I've taken a call kind of mid-morning, I get generally more males responding to those. But it, but in the kind of the midnight ones, I do occasionally get females being caught as well. But yes, I do ring those. But we we don't put the the tags. We didn't put the tags on the back of those birds because there's 
there's kind of a thought that they might not be um, faith, like sight faithful. It's generally the males that are sight faithful. So if you're wanting the tag back, and bear in mind that these tags, the ge like the geolocators there, I think they were about £300. And then the, the GPS ones, they were getting towards the £400 mark. So it's a lot of money to put on the back of a bird to potentially not get back. So, so yeah, so the females are ringed as normal and, and kind of let go. So when I've usually caught those nightingales, I, I take them back to those territories that they came out of rather than releasing them somewhere in the middle of a field that's close. But I prefer to actually go and take them back and put them straight back on the territory as quick as I can. There's another question from Denise again. You mentioned fog, but do they sing in the rain? They do. They they still sing in the rain. The rain doesn't really stop them. It's only us that want that when we're getting out of the car that you think I don't really want to be getting soaked. It's just the it's just the fog that they don't sing through. Mike had shared with me the song of a nightingale recorded on a nighttime survey. Here's a little of that song which I presented in the live stream as a video of the sonograph, or visual representation of the song. you'll notice that where you've got the the gaps in the sonograph where it goes quiet that they're always the same space in between it so whatever nightingale i've recorded it's almost like you can go one two three four and it joins into the next one every time so uh so yeah so there's there's meant to be i mean the call is is really complex for the size of the bird, it's got about, they reckon about about a thousand um, different phrases of its song that it puts together, and compare that to a blackbird that has that has a hundred different phrases. And the other bit with it, I think, is quite amazing with the nightingale is that if you are lucky enough to see one singing, there's times that you just see where its beak is just moving, and that's because part of their song actually goes past our hearing range mm. and they reckon that it's about 25% of that song that we actually don't hear. So, so yeah, quite amazing, really. Someone has come in with a question. It's someone from the Facebook group. Can you explain how they do this, the exact space between calls and the complexity of the sounds? It's, it's just how the, how the birds will, will naturally sing. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's like how we, we talk that still... You'll be breathing and they build things in phrases in short bursts. Because if you've got to think that they've got to be singing quite loud to be getting over kind of background noise and bits like that. So it's like with us talking, we pause for a breath before we learn, launch into the next bit. But with Nightingale, it's just the same set pattern of, of spacing. And sometimes if they're singing long enough, they will then start to mimic each other and kind of copy each other as well. So the idea is to outdo each other. Um, I've got another uh, comment, but this person said, yes, the regularity of their calls or song. I always like to count the space in between utterances, like sparrows, etc. It's fun to do until something distracts them. It, it is. And like, like, like I just said, pointed out with the nightingale, that if you're counting four, that it's, it is every four. And just when you've done the fourth, it then starts again. And uh, and I, I told that my my seven year old daughter, and she thought that that was amazing, that uh, we were listening to a recording of one, and we were we were all sat around the kitchen table going one, two, three, four, and then it would start, and then you'd listen to it sing, and then you'd be one, two, three, four, and it'd go again. I wish I'd known that before um, I went to Suffolk because I was hearing this bird singing in the night. And it was such a different sound to anything that I'd heard before, which is what immediately made me think of 
the nightingale. There were pauses between the phrases. It, it felt like it was falling asleep. You know, it's like, I'll have a sing and then I'll just sleep for a little bit and then I'll go back to, to sing again. Yeah. It's clearly that same thing. I'm convinced that's what I heard. To think that they come all the way from Africa, they make those really, really long journeys and are just here for such a short time. It's just a real wonder of nature. With the bird ring inside of it, I feel it's, it's such a privilege to be able to to handle those birds and to be collecting the, the data and know that that data is actually being used. And then one of the, the bird that I showed you that had gone all the way down to Sierra Leone, we'd caught that bird as an adult. And it was, so that was in 2012. And it was still, I last caught it in 2015. And if you, if you kind of work out the miles that it is done, so if it was an adult in 2012, so it would have been a juvenile bird in 2011. So it's probably hatched in 2010. So it could have potentially been like a five-year-old bird. And that's almost done, probably getting on towards 80,000 miles that that bird had done. So it's those kind of bits that I think it kind of makes you sometimes feel insignificant with things and that, we think that we're quite important when actually there's a lot of things out there that are doing things just to survive. So I feel that the work that I've been doing with, with whether it's with Angling Water, with the Wildlife Trust and my volunteers, that we're actually trying to make a difference. And then I think it was back in 2018 when we'd finished a lot of the research work that we held a, a conference um, to bring a lot of the Wildlife Trust together uh, we brought people like RSPB, BirdLife International in, because even though I, I work to a, a region, that these birds don't see regions, they don't see geographical places, they don't see that they're flying into France or the UK. They don't see any of that, so they see no borders. So even though we work in borders, that I wanted to get kind of international people over so that to use this data that we'd been gathering to actually try and get change in, in France and down into Spain and different parts of Africa. Because if it's the same route, when you look at the route that the nightingales are taking, it's a similar kind of route that cuckoos are taking. It's the same route that ospreys are taking. So there's obviously something with those routes. And the idea is that why should we sit on this data ourselves and not actually share it and it be used not only here in the UK, but kind of elsewhere. So we would be able to use that data to consider what is it about the habitats it's either overflying and stopping in or where it's ending up to make sure that we're not denuding those areas of the the one kind of habitat that it needs. And, and you mentioning earlier about the difficulties with the muntjac deer or the rabbits and potentially with people changing the size of fields and change, getting rid of hedgerows, all of that would mean that they make that journey and then don't find the habitat that they need to be able to make their, their nests. And we, we touched on about like climate change because our climate kind of mirrors, like in terms of the rainy season in Africa, that our spring starts at the roughly the same kind as those rainy seasons in Africa. So as the rain starts moving further north for Africa, it means that those flies and that that start coming out of those ponds and those bumper crops that, that those birds will be needing like nightingales or swifts or swallows that that kind of marries kind of what happens in the UK with in terms of our spring starting so if they start to get out of kilter with each other then you could actually find that the birds that rely on those migratory seasons like the rainy seasons if they haven't started their migration at that point that you could find that those ponds have already started having the insects hatching and flying out that by the time they get to those pools they could have actually come to the end of when the the main crop of flies is which means that they've not fed up that much and got the fat reserves on before they need to make that next crossing and then them being pushed to go further north to find somewhere else to try and fuel up before they make the next stop it's a very fine balance but then you've got really good environmental schemes over here in the UK where the government's trying to encourage farmers and other landowners to put hedgerows back and put bigger field margins in and put ditches back and put wood and ponds in. So we've got 
a site um, not far away from, from Grafham where we've got a nightingale population just on the outskirts of our site. But I'm looking at trying to improve that that site for nightingales and we've dug kind of four woodland ponds in there as well. But it'd be good for, for me surveying them with being bitten by mosquitoes and things like that. But as long as the nightingales and other birds like it, then that's that's fine by me. The management of the, the scrubby stuff, if you imagine that when it's kind of really tall, about what, 20 feet high, something like that, that it can actually shade out a lot of things underneath. But then as soon as you bring that tree canopy down, whether it's via like coppicing or the, the layering work, you then get a burst of flowers, whether it's like primroses, bluebells, if you're in ancient woodlands, um, you get lots of other type of wildflowers that are coming back up through that are kind of the, the ones that have been missing the sunlight, which then means that they're a good nectar source for bees and butterflies and moths, and which then are great food sources for birds and, and everything else. So actually by kind of managing woodlands, it actually improves a lot of other diversity as well. So sometimes it can look quite quite drastic what you've done. But on the other side, that if you leave it a year or two, that it looks like you've never really been in there and everything's green again. So it's it's quite amazing, really, about how what you can do and how kind of sometimes fragile everything is. Thank you so much for your time this evening, Mike. And uh, if you're in the Facebook group, you'll know that Mike is a very active member in there. So come along and chat with him. Do you have a presence online, Mike, where people can interact with you other than in the Facebook group? I do have um, a a Twitter account, uh, which is Micklemus79. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I tweet on there about some of the things that I do for work. Or we have got um, an Anglian Water account, which is uh, which is called Coast and Country. So find out about what Anglian Water is doing in terms of biodiversity work and our catchment work where we're working with farmers in terms of kind of chemicals and what goes into rivers and try not to get those into rivers where we abstract water from so find out all things like that what we're doing for the environment with with angling water thanks to mike for sharing his recordings of singing nightingales and to nick clayton for his photograph of a nightingale that's used in the episode artwork Personal recommendation is a powerful way to help others find the show. If you enjoy what you hear, please tell a friend or give the show a shout out on social media. You can also help support the show's production by contributing to our tip jar. And the easiest way to do this is to buy me a virtual coffee. Your donations help fund my production costs and are very much appreciated. Do keep in touch. Tell me about your sightings by leaving me a message on SpeakPipe or on the contact form on my website, casualbirder.com, and sign up for my newsletter, Casual Birder Weekly. Take a look at the episode notes for links to these. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by following the show, wherever you listen. Thanks to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. Mm-hmm.